Okay, so this is the outline. It might change a little bit as we go through. Um, so today's lecture, I'm going to try and give you a sense of what type of systems we are interested in trying to tackle and why for these kinds of systems, we need to extend our sort of standard um, tools of statistical mechanics or explore outside the box and try to think of ways of tackling these problems. And of course, you know, when you look carefully, you always find clues in other areas of physics or other areas of statistical mechanics even where you can learn from. So my, uh, my hope is that that's, that's the message I can try to get to you through these lectures. But uh, uh, today, my, the other um, objective that I have is to give you some phenomena uh, to, to, to give this idea why, why we should be interested in these systems. Why are these systems interesting at all? So there will not be any, uh, so today's the rest of the lecture will actually be PowerPoint and me just talking. I'm not gonna write anything on the black, on my iPad. Lecture two is when um, we will start exploring things bit by bit. So lecture two, you can almost think of as uh, how would I do the analog of thermodynamics for these systems or the basics of statistical mechanics? How do we, construct uh, ensembles. What do we mean by statistical ensembles for these kinds of systems? And, and granular thermodynamics, which was uh, proposed originally by Sir Sam Edwards many, many years ago. And we understand it a lot better now. And of course, uh, related to that, the idea of statistical ensembles, uh, I, we have these deeply ingrained ideas in statistical mechanics of what are, what are the conserved quantities? What is conserved that we can coarse grain, that we can think about fluctuating and still, still have these ideas that because this quantity is conserved, I can actually construct some kind of a ensemble by maximizing entropy subjected to these conser conservation laws. Right, so what can you do to in these systems that are conserved where energy, the, 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 the normal ones, as you will see, are not. Um, and conserved quantities is what lead us to continuum theories. So that's, um, that is the ultimate aim. So I, I sort of titled this lecture as saying, constructing statistical field theories for these kinds of systems. So of course, then we need to get to a continuum theory. So what I will do in lecture two is illustrate uh, these ideas of ensembles, conserved quantities, constructing a field theory uh, through a much simpler system, which is a classical spin system, frustrated magnets, which has been studied for a long time. And in my distant past, uh, I studied these systems also. And then either at that lecture or it might roll on to the next lecture, I'll give you an example of how we have used these ideas of ensembles to actually explore one of these athermal systems, which shows some interesting, shows an interesting phase transition. So lecture three will, uh, is where I will discuss what I call, what we call emergent gauge theories. And again, I will argue that that's the basis for constructing some kind of continuum theories for these systems. And again, I'll fall back on these classical spins, frustrated magnets, where this is well established that you have emergent gauge theories. And so then the question that we will explore after that is how can you generalize those ideas from spin systems on lattices to these much more complicated uh, sort of particulate systems, which have no fluctuation, no thermal fluctuations, but of course there are fluctuations. And a question that I'll arise today, it's lecture for certain is how do we even think about these fluctuations? And I want you all to think about uh, that. I will not give you any, uh, any um, prescription today for how to think about these. I want you to think about these today 
maybe at the at the tutorial tomorrow before you come to these lectures and we will just explore together at the end of the lecture today how we can think about how do we make a dent in this sort of way of thinking about these athermal systems um so I'll talk about the classical spins, Coulomb was there, there's a classic phase called the Coulomb phase and we'll think about that. That you will see is just Maxwell theory. Um, that's the emergent gauge theory in these classical spin systems. Are there phase transitions in these? What kinds of phase transitions do you have? And so lecture four will then lead to something that I have, we've been working on very recently. Um, and this is my collaboration with Shubro at ICTS is generalizing Maxwell's theory, generalizing uh, standard ENM to um, a different framework where the charges are not scalars, but the charges are vectors. And then you will see that that sort of naturally leads to understanding uh, how stresses get transmitted in this. So the mechanics of these athermal materials. And so lecture, so, so lecture four will set up the, the stage for then lecture five, uh, where I will discuss this very recent work at least, but in a pedagogical way, of course, um, where we are trying to understand why disordered, amorphous, athermal, non-thermal systems, which I will define in just a few minutes, um, behave as if they're elastic, even though the fundamental uh, assumptions that underlie uh, the theory of elasticity have all sort of fallen apart. So is there sort of another completely different paradigm um, that lets us understand uh, the emergence of shear rigidity, rigidity in these systems, um, which is different from uh, the ideas of broken symmetry and free energy, which is the foundation of classical elasticity theory. So that's where we will end. So I'm going to switch off this and go to my uh, uh, PowerPoint for today. But is there, are there any thoughts, questions before I go there? Okay, so I'm, I'll, I'm hoping that people will start asking questions soon. Okay, so let me begin by sort of turning our usual paradigm on its head, right? So what I have been interested for over a decade now is understanding the collective behavior of particles, which for a lack of a better word and hopefully it'll become clearer, I'm calling particles whose interactions are noisy, but there is no thermal noise. So this is the complete opposite of where we usually start our statistical mechanics exploration from, right? We usually say we know the microscopic interactions uh, and the reason we need to go to a statistical description of our system is there are fluctuations coming either because they're driven or there are thermal fluctuations, but at least we know what the microscopic interactions are. Here, even though in principle, in the kinds of systems that we're interested in, in principle, it might be possible to figure out the interactions. In practice, it's either not possible or it doesn't make any sense. Just like in normal statistical mechanics, you know, I can run molecular dynamic simulations for many, 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 many systems. And it's a deterministic classical system. I can put, you know, I don't have to uh, write down a Langevin equation, but we do because upon coarse graining, knowing it, it, it's much more helpful. It's a much better way to think about the system statistically than then you know, look at every position and every momentum um, as as look at my ten to the twenty third particles and not think about them statistically. So here it's a similar problem 
in that. And so what you're seeing in my background, and I'll make you think through these kinds of systems, is, um, is, a, micros uh, is a picture under a microscope of sand grains. Um, and you see that there are different sizes. They are large. The, the scale bar, you should be able to see the scale bar is about one millimeter here. So, so they're large. But as you can see, that the way they interact with each other will depend crucially on the shapes of these particles, what their surface properties are. We don't think about surface properties of atoms and molecules, right? We don't because they're microscopic. But here, these are macroscopic particles, which actually, and I'll show you more pictures of this. So, so we will explore this idea that in these systems, there are a few things that happen. One is that the interactions are extremely sensitive to small displacements of the particles, like small displacements of the particles create uh, uh, different forces. The forces fluctuate. Also, they're extremely sensitive to way, the way you drive them. Like if you shear them or shake them, you might bring particles uh, close together or take them far apart, and that changes the interactions completely. So with infinite resolution or you know, nanometer resolutions on systems that are constructed out of particles that are one to two millimeters, you might be able to pin down the interactions, but as soon as you drive them, that, those interactions might be completely different. So for example, I have a colleague who studies cement, right? How, how do, you know, what happens in cement? And you can map it onto a statmec problem, but you have to include the chemical interactions that, that, change, that, that take place as you make cement. And of course that changes the interaction, those chemical interactions then make a highly non-trivial sort of time dependent potential or time dependent interaction that enters the system. So these are the kinds of things that are our challenges. Uh, there was a question in the chat. There was a question, okay. Uh, so uh, the question is, uh, does no thermal noise mean we are at zero temperature? So of course we are never at zero temperature, but so I will explore that. But what I mean by no thermal noise is there's no Brownian motion. Right, so this, this, if the particles are large enough that at, the, at room temperature or even temperatures that we can get to um, within any sort of conceivable universe, um, they are so heavy, their mass, so the gravitational energy is much, 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 much higher than KT. So there are, there's no Brownian motion. Does that answer the question? Bulbul, may I ask you? Yeah. So is it then the states are only governed by the minimum energy configurations only, or there are something in addition? There's something in addition, right? Because it's not minimum energy because you have friction. So, so there is, it's a, it's a, so, so that's one of the things that we'll explore, right? How do we characterize these states and how do we construct ensembles? Uh, but um, but these systems are not ergodic at all, right? So they're driven only if you do something to them. They're, they change states only if you do something to them. Okay. So, so then, you know, in some ways one can say, oh, why are we even thinking about statistical mechanics? These are just history dependent systems. But there are lots and lots of hints, and that's what I'll go into right now, is that the fluctuations are reproducible. There are reproducible probability distributions. So we can't just chuck the whole um, StatMec framework out. There, is, there are hints in here saying, we should be able to construct something. And you know, it, it may be like a large deviation function, or it may be something, and we're still exploring those, making small, you know, we are uh, making uh, progress, definitely. Um, but we don't quite, un and we have lots and lots of hints. We're collecting more and more evidence that underlying this is, um, 
is a robust statistical mechanics framework. So um, maybe at the, in the last lecture, I will uh, tell you about a system where we actually see scaling collapse as if I, as, as I would in some kind of equilibrium system near a phase transition. I see the scaling collapse, but I don't have an underlying theory of why the scaling collapse is happening yet. I see more questions, but why can't I see them? Uh, um, the system never, yes, the system never equilibrates. If you mean by equilibrating, exploring all of phase space and getting there, there is no such equilibration here. So, so yeah, so those are the, those are the, the questions. And um, so let me, uh, so I think those are the questions I'd sort of listed so let's go through that and then we'll go to. Okay, so I've said this already, right? So in, I think I've said enough about this for now. So why do we look to statistical mechanics? As I was saying, distributions are reproducible. And this is what got me into the field, right? So my, my longtime colleague, Bob Berenger, who passed away two years ago, uh, sat in one of my talks and or one of my students talks and then uh, you know we were just beginning to explore all of these and he said she, he came to me and said look well, well, the, the, product, the, the probability distributions are reproducible and Bob comes from um, a helium-3 helium-4 low temperature you know where they looked at scaling collapse and RG that that uh, that uh, field and started exploring granular materials in the late 90s so by looking at distributions, he had this insight that these have to be mappable to some kind of stat mag because what he was seeing, the kinds of distributions, the kinds of non-Gaussian distributions that he was seeing uh, were all um, reminded him of things that he saw uh, earlier. I don't know why this is dubious. Okay, so, so I will give you, and I'm not, you know, I'm not giving, I'm not going to give you a completely extensive uh, list of these fluctuations, but I'll give you some examples, which are probably are the ones that actually made me interested in this subject. So then, the, so I think this, this comes to uh, the question of equilibration and statistical ensembles. Uh, even before that, we need to think about how do we describe the microstates. We normally, for a particulate system, we would say the microstates are defined by uh, position and momenta, and then we ha have the interactions, and that's all we need to know, right? But here, um, the kinds of systems that we will be looking at mostly, where we have made any progress, are uh, non-inertial. So, so the momentum is all, uh, so they are, they are dissipative, they are um, overdamped systems. So momentum sort of goes out the window, but positions are not enough. In the sense, when I say momentum go outside the window, there's no momentum density, let's say, right? So the, the, I'm always uh, at uh, zero momentum, I'm satisfying. Uh, there's no inertial term, right? There's no, but I cannot just look at particle positions because this indeterminacy in the interactions, um, it's very difficult for me to say, oh, if the two particles are separated by this, uh, this R vector, then this is the interaction between them. So, in, so we, at the minimum, need to enlarge our definition of a microstate to include these interactions or the forces, right? So one way to think about it is I give you both the positions and the forces. Now, of course, that immediately leads to a problem because there are very, very few systems, as you will see, these kinds of particulate systems where the forces can be directly measured, right? How do you measure forces? So again, this was because of these, um, experimental developments that came primarily from uh, the Behringer group, but also uh, Sid Nagel and Heinrich Jaeger's group at Chicago that let us sort of gave us uh, a microscope into looking at forces 
which then helped us to try and even construct some, or get wherever we are now. Yeah, so what, So then once you have the microstates, then the next question is how do we think of a statistical ensemble? And to me, a statistical, when I say, how do I construct a generalized statistical ensemble? What I'm looking for is can I construct, can I uh, pose uh, a priori probability distribution of these microstates? Right, so that's what we do in a canonical ensemble or a microcanonical ensemble. I say, if you give me a microstate in a canonical ensemble, the weight with which the probability with which I'll, I'll sample that microstate is e to the minus beta e nu, right? And then I don't have to do an actual uh, uh, experiment to see what these probabilities are. We know that those are the probabilities, and then I can write down a partition function and do calculations, right? So if we can construct such an a priori probability distribution, right, then that's a major step forward because then I can say, I can write down some kind of a partition function. I can calculate correlations. I can do things using the generating function, which is the, the partition function. If I know these probability distributions, if I don't know them, then I'll have to look at the full time series. I'll have to try to figure out what's happening case by case, right? So, um, so I'll, uh, I'll, so, so that will, the second lecture is when we will explore these ideas of, um, ensembles. So for the rest of, oh, I have more chats, hang on. Yeah, so phase space analog in these systems are configurations that are allowed by my constraints or conserved quantities. So this is, this is a very good question. Right, so suppose I, um, and you'll see examples today. Suppose I say, okay, I have created a sand file under gravity, right? And so what do I know? I know that uh, if, if I do this repeatedly, right? With the same set of grains, like, you know, so if I take, I have managed to, con to get uh, the, so the same shape, so, so same sh shape of grains, but, but I repeat this experiment, I just pour them. I'll get different sand files, but they will have some universal properties for certain, right? So that's the, uh, that's the ensemble, right? And the phase space is then all of the configurations. And I will just say a little bit, it's not just the geometric configurations, it's also the force configurations. Because I have uh, friction, at same geometry doesn't mean that I have the same uh, forces. And so that's why we need to enlarge our phase space to include positions and forces. And then yes, the phase space is just the configurations in this space, the microstates. What do I mean by distributions are reproducible? You'll see in a minute, but, but uh, quickly, you know, if you do, again, let's say take the sand file experiment and I may measure some properties of it. Let's say I measure what are the force distributions in the, inside a sand pile. If I do this experiment repeatedly, or if I do it 10 days from now, I will get the same distribution, right? That distribution doesn't change. There are, there are subtleties here. The, the contacts and between the sand grains, it seems, ages over a very, very long time. So if I create a sand file and let it sit there for a month, maybe the distribution will very slowly age to something. But those kinds of things, we at least have some ways of thinking about given all of the, um, all of the recent progress or even progress of our long time over glassy systems, but glassy systems do age, right? But glassy systems, at least I know where to start from. So, so we have to take this step by step, but that's what I mean by distributions are reproducible. That uh, if I, if you uh, that distributions are determined by a few macroscopic quantities that I can specify doesn't depend on every possible detail, and what it depends upon, right? So normally, what do I say? The distribution. I say, since energy is conserved, right? 
or the, or if I'm looking at a um, at a thermal system, if you give me the temperature and you give me the same system, I know exactly what the distribution of let's say uh, the, 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 the pair correlation function for this system will look like at every temperature, if I know what the system is. But it, it doesn't depend on how I, how I created it. It depends only on the temperature, volume, number of particles, things like that. So that's what I mean by distributions are reproducible. Um, there's no reason that there is no inertial term. Of course, you know, in, in rapid flows, there are inertial terms, but that's where we haven't made any, I, at least the kind of work that I have been doing hasn't made any dent yet. So for the purposes of these lectures, I'm going to focus only on non-inertial systems so far. No, sand grains are definitely not, uh, oh, hang on. There's no uncertainty principle here. These are classical systems. Um, so there's no uncertainty principle. The positions and momenta can be determined separately. No, we are certainly not uh, modeling sand grains as point particles, right? That's the picture here. And you'll see more um, the, 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 the size, shape, distribution, everything matters. Um, so, so jam states are a particular class of states and jam states can be characterized by some distributions, but I can also have flowing states, uh, which are also, that's the question is, are, can, all, can those also be um, uh, described by distributions that, are, that, that I know uh, will be there if I take that system and drive it in the same way? Yeah, 3D. So, so that's what we are asking, right? So, so that the, the question you're asking about like shear modulus, think is the last thing we will touch upon. And this is very recent, right? So there is. So phenomenologically, people had found that you, you they, looks like there is their shear moduli. But for example, the shear moduli of, uh, of a pile of sand depends on whether you created it through the same sand, right? But the shear modulus depends on whether you created it through uniaxial compression or through shear or through pure pressure. So, so that's when people started saying, oh, this is so history dependent, right? That, but it's not history dependence is what we hope to show. It's not history dependence. It really depends on what stresses you're putting on the system on the boundary. So, so once I specify, and that's what I mean by reproducible. If, so if I can show that the properties, including shear moduli compressibility are determined, if I tell you what force, what, uh, what stresses I have imposed on the boundary, then certainly it's not a microscopic property like elastic moduli in uh, normal systems. It's an emergent property. But if, you t if I know that it will be the same modulus when I put the same pressure on it, and if I can predict how it depends on that pressure, which is sort of the next level, right? So can we first at least show that it doesn't depend on anything else? And then microscopically how it emerges is a deeper or a more difficult question. Okay, this is good. Okay, so for the next, uh, for the rest of the, ta uh, the, the this lecture, um, you can see the bottom of my slide, right? It's not getting cut up. Okay. Uh, yep. Okay, so I'm gonna show you pictures um, 
and images and graphs um, to share some phenomenology. But I also want you to participate in some thought experiments with me. I'm trying this out for the first time, so we'll see how it goes. Okay, so just a little bit uh, more, um, this we can do quickly. Um, Abhishek, they can see the lectures on, the, it's recorded and I can also post the slides on the, on the website, right, afterwards? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, so, so um, I have laid out a very broad set of um, goals or problems for us, um, but what uh, we have been focusing upon mostly um, are systems with the, the properties that I've listed here. So they're a collection of macroscopic objects, which is why they're non-Brownian. Mostly, for most of the systems that we have been interested in, we are looking at purely repulsive contact interactions. So there is no attraction, but that in certain systems that we have looked at now, that's not, um, that's not a restriction. Um, and okay, so, so no thermal fluctuations, et cetera. Okay, so um, what I'm showing you here is actually an electron micrograph of sand. And what I want you to see is that these particles are of different shapes not just shapes and size, but their surfaces are completely different, right? So this is my giving you a little more insight as to why I say the interactions are basically unknowable, right? Because when these things touch each other, that's, well, that's the only time they contact in this dry sand, and I'll explore a little bit. So in these regions where there are gaps, right? These particles are not contacting. Now, whether a particle is in contact or not, right? So from knowing the positions of the grains, it's not possible to know, right? So I, and if I move this by a, a nanometer or half a nanometer, these two sand grains, which are now not touching, will touch. And not only that, they might touch here, they might rotate and touch there, and depending on exact, so people who do, do tribology, right, are very interested in understanding the properties of the surface roughness and it uh, determines uh, and how to determine those interactions. So that's certainly, you know, something that one can be interested in and one should be asking. We have been sort of lazy and saying, you know, that's too much work or again, coming from, you know, stat mech and, uh, and coarse graining, who cares, right? Can we come up with something else that can that uh, survives coarse graining? And I don't need to know the precise details of how things are touching. So I think then I just had, so this, these are coffee grains, same thing. This I will show you now the, to, to show how complicated these surfaces are. This is just coffee beans. Sorry, I don't know why it, uh, I should have turned it around, but uh, so the width, the, uh, this uh, scale bar here is 100 microns. Now, these are electron micrographs given to me by a friend. The next one goes to the scale bar going to 10 microns, I think. And what you will see, uh, these are beautiful patterns, but these are now focusing on the surface, right? So what I'm trying to say is if we went down this route of trying to figure out interactions, I would have to do some kind of um, scaling here. I would have to understand how structures at this scale uh, coarse grain out to the contact scale, so on and so forth. And I think that's a, that, that some people are trying to do that. And it's an extremely interesting subject, but that's not what we are trying to do. Okay. So now I'm going to uh, just focus on one of these or a different one. So these are sand grains, again, electron micrograph. Let's try to think about some, doing some thought experiments with this. So, so th these are of course uh, lying flat on some surface. Gravity is not pointing this way, gravity is pointing that way. 
what if I if I actually did tilt it, right? Then this the they will fall under gravity. They'll make contacts because of this diversity of shapes and sizes. They will form a very very disordered rough pile. Correct. And what we are trying to understand then is if I did this experiment many, many, many times, suppose, you know, I created this, this, this exact configuration horizontally, right? And then I kept, and I did this tilting, uh, then hopefully, th then do I get the same configurations? That's one question. The other question is, suppose I take this configuration and moved a few and vibrated it slightly, tapped it, got a slightly different configuration. What would that configuration look like? If I tilted that under gravity, what would that configuration look like? So what, what, what remains robust? What can we, um, what can we uh, hang our hats on to try and construct these distributions? If we, for example, see that certain properties do remain invariant when we do these small perturbations and, and small perturbations. If I perturb them, you know, if I'm not gently tapping them, I'm making them flow down an incline and go and collect somewhere else, that might be a very different situation, right? So, but again, all of these are questions. We don't know what I mean by small, right? What, what it, under what kinds of small perturbations do I get reprodu reproducibility? Uh, um, do uh, am I um, am I stuck with saying oh I cannot do and I, I cannot predict any collective behavior or can we predict some collective behavior like angle of repose is something that engineers know is reproducible right why is it right so those are the kinds of questions that we want to ask and how do the let's say the angle, how does the angle of repose depend on some properties of some coarse grained properties of the system that we are looking at? So Bulbul, I mean, uh, one, yeah. so when you tilt, you just want to tilt a little bit so that it just goes to in, into a new uh, stable configuration. So let's say I'm slowly tilting up, right? right and yeah. I sort of let it fall gently and then I make it vertical which then will then make a sand part, right? It has to. Uh, but I'm not doing this, right? So I'm not saying. Right, yeah, you just tilting a little bit so that it goes into another stable configuration. Exactly, right. 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 Every, yeah, okay. so, so, that's the, so that's a very good point. And I'm, so anything that we've done so far is where we do that. We, we do a small change, right? So it's like adding a small field and letting the system come to equilibrium. Here it's not coming to equilibrium, but it's coming to whatever satisfies gravity and its own forces and forces and torques, right? right yeah. But I always do it a little bit and, and wait. Right, okay. Uh, so another, another question is like this picture you show now, I mean, it, this could as well have been like pebbles of size, let's say centimeters or something, right? And uh, I guess the physics will be completely the same. Uh, I mean, if you just scale things appropriate uh, in some way. And uh, so the question is, um, whoops. Did you lose me for a minute? Said my uh, yeah. interconnection is unstable. Um, uh, I can actually get out of this. Um, yeah, so that's also a question, right? So at what scale of, uh, at, at what size are the, the things that we are talking about becoming important? So one scale of course is, I want KT to be much, much, much smaller than the gravitational energy of these systems. Right, yeah. so I can't raise them. I, I, there are no Brownian, there's no Brownian motion, at least for most systems. Um, so there's a huge range, right? Like even asteroid belts, people say, follow the same, uh, same, it, and their gravity, of course, plays a huge role in assembling them. Yeah. 
But but yes, at one point there was someone from NASA who wanted to come and talk to us because they see some features where again uh, it's the yeah they thought some granular things might work there. We never tried it, but but you know even at that scale it works. So there's a large range. I would say anything. Uh, so call right. So what what maybe one distinction it's crucial for me to make here. Colloids are micron sized. And for colloids, Brownian motion is important, right? Yeah. right? So, so then we transition to this, what I call granular or a-thermal uh, part, uh, particulate systems where we are higher than microns, right? So maybe um, let's say millimeter to, you know, asteroid sizes. These are all as, as long as I can make large collection of them, the question right. is uh, what, what is the collective behavior that emerges or is there some common, is there a field theory of uh, certain properties at least? So what, what is the size of these ones? I think, hang on, let me look at it. Is it millimeter? Or? I think yeah. these are millimeters. It's just a normal sand, right? And, uh, this is normal sand. I think these are millimeters. Okay, so another thought experiment is suppose these were actually suspended in a fluid, right? Which people do. Uh, you have suspensions, right? And now one do thing does change. Now, let's say if I'm uh, sharing the, the, the system, there is fluid between these grains. And so there is an interaction between the grains mediated by the fluid. But suppose the, the, uh, I'm sharing such that the fluid layer between some of them goes away. Let's say the rest, right? These ones, there's still lots of fluid, but I don't know if you can see my pointer. Can you see my pointer? No, uh, I need to be, oops. Yeah, we can see the pointer. You can see the pointer, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's say, you know, here there's a big gap. So there's liquid there, but here there are small gaps, right? So if I shear just a little bit, maybe the, gap, the liquid between these two layers gets sheared away. There is no lubricated layer and there's no lubrication by the fluid anymore. So then certain grains will have this surf, rough surface frictional contact, solid on solid rough surface contact. And some grains will have lubricated contacts. And without knowing precisely the configuration, again, we don't know which one is which, right? And this is actually, this is a system that I've been now exploring for um, the last, since 2018 with people. And it's an extremely interesting system where you have um, suspensions, dense suspensions, uh, and then you shear them. And then you ask what happens and it's this, and this is, this is a, to me, a classic example of where you, how you drive the system or the interactions between the particles are exceedingly sensitive to how you drive the system. Because you change the nature of the interactions by moving them by nanometers or, you know, so, so some, you know, some parts of the system have one, uh, one kind of interaction. Some parts of the system don't uh, have a different kind, but the, it's not that I know this part of the system is lubricated and this part is frictional, right? It's all just random spread out. So we have to think about mm, a distribution of these interactions themselves or where they are, right? So, so those are the challenges and then the, of course, then the question is, how do we try to make a dent uh, in these kinds of systems? So for before tomorrow's lecture, I would like all of you to, to think through that question, right? So this seems like sort of an insurmountable problem, but you know, I wouldn't be here talking to you if you haven't made any dents in this, but I want to hear from you all to say, okay, how can we think about the system? How can we 
in every physics problem, right? We try to idealize it to a point where we haven't idealized, where we haven't thrown the baby out of the bathwater, but it's idealized to a point where I can make some progress. So I think that's my main question to all of you uh, before the before we meet tomorrow is um, is what kind what what can we idealize? What can we throw out of these systems, or how can we simplify it? Okay, but so let me move on. Oh, there is there are questions in the chat. Hang on. In this case, irrespective of size of grains, interactions should not change. I actually don't un quite understand the, that question. Uh, maybe you can uh, clarify, or we can do this after the after the lecture today. Um, uh, when uh, we cannot define the forces between these, but. What I mean by that is we do need to know the forces, to know the microstate. Um, but I am thinking of that as, um, right, just like I don't specify positions in my statistical ensemble, in my microstate, right? I say, oh, I have positions and momenta. And I ask, what's the probability distribution of finding positions and momenta? Right, given a temperature. So it's in the same way that we're going to talk about forces here. Right, so there's a probability distribution of a set of positions and set of forces. And the question is, can I a priori, if I tell you what the stresses are on the system or something else, how I'm driving it, is that probability of finding certain set of uh, positions and forces uh, is that probability of finding is given. I don't know the forces exactly. Just like I don't know the positions exactly when I think of a system at a given temperature. Does that make sense? Okay, is it fair to say the interaction of the particles primarily? Yes, right. So, you know, the only way these configurations change is through external influence, through external driving. But something could have been interacting, something could have been touching each other and then doesn't touch when I drive it, or they were not touching and they come into contact. Uh, disorder is extremely important through the, uh, so disorder of something, right? So it can be size, shape, um, surface roughness, right? So. So some, if I take, and, and I have a picture later on of uh, something, if I take perfect, uh, if I have uh, no disorder in the particle shape, size, interactions, then, then yeah, then, then uh, we have a much simpler system. Okay, so I want to show you, um, so I've been, um, so this is one kind of idealization. This is an experimental idealization. I'll show you a video from Bob Beringer's lab. And this is what I was saying before that um, to, make, to make the kinds of progress that we have made, it was extremely important for us to at least in some model systems, know what the forces are doing inside. So Beringer in, um, in the mid nineties, came up with this idea of using photoelastic material as a granular uh, system, right? So here, uh, the disorder is only in the sizes. So what I have here, so you're looking down on a table. So the gravity is not this way, gravity is into my screen. And what these, the, the circles that you are seeing are the top surfaces of some very fat cylinders. Oh, actually, I have, I turn on, um, but I have to go and find it. But so these are, um, oh, again, did you lose me for a second? Yeah. Yes, back. Yeah, it keeps mm -hmm. saying, so we had a, <laughs> We are out in the woods, right? So last afternoon, a big tree fell and caused an electrical fire. 
and we had to call the fire department it was the next house away from us. So I think we still have some iffy internet connection because of that. But okay, so yeah, so let me know if I'm getting cut out. So, so these things are sort of fat cylinders which are made out of photoelastic material. So for those of you who don't know what photoelastic material is, you can look it up uh, by tomorrow. But basically these are materials which become biofringent under stress. So then if you look at them uh, under a polarizer, you will see regions which are, so the light regions here are highly stressed and the dark regions here are not stressed at all. So I will play this video, but before that, what I want to tell you is the major um, uh, breakthrough that Bob and his group came up with, Bob Berenger and his group did in the mid, uh, in 2010 or 20, I think 2010, around 10 years ago, 11 years ago, is they came up with an algorithm, just sort of a reverse Monte Carlo, using which by looking at these patterns, these biofringence patterns, they can actually uh, extract out the forces at every contact. And they do it with pretty remarkable accuracy. And not just the normal force, the normal force and the tangential force. So this then lets people like theorists like me actually construct the position and forces for a given configuration and see if these distributions are reproducible or not. Or you know, what is reproducible? What distributions made out of positions and forces can we look at that uh, does not change uh, under coarse graining, let's say. So this was a major, major uh, breakthrough for, for us. Okay, so, let, so this particular video I'll show you, uh, what I want you to focus upon are, so, so a few things which will become very, very important when we actually delve into constructing theories for these systems is that the contacts are what matter, right? So you'll see that, and the space is partitioned into grains and voids, right? So I have very complicated shaped voids between grains. And then I have the grains, which are the circles. And the contacts uh, are where the, where any interaction between these grains happen. So what I want you to focus upon as I play the video, which is, a, is a, uh, the experiment that they're doing is shearing this system um, using a very particular apparatus that I don't want to get into. But it's, this is sitting on a table on sort of slidable slats and they do a uniform shear. So this, this was also very important. In these kinds of systems, there is uh, an arcsum effect, which is called shear banding, where the shear gets localized in parts of the system and is not homogeneously throughout the system. And those systems are, are much harder to tackle um, theoretically than something with a homogeneously sheared system. So he created this uh, experimental system where things, the shear, uh, the, the, if you measure the displacements of the particles and then it's, on a some coarse grain scale. If you look at the strain, the strain is homogeneous. Okay, so I'm gonna play this and then we can... Right, so this, so what happened is that, let me, so at this point, the dense, so in, in this experiment that I showed you, the density of the particles didn't change. It's the same number of particles and they're dense enough that as if you follow it again, you'll see their positions are not changing very much, right? They just sort of finally follow the shear motion, but the forces change dramatically, correct? And so interestingly, this experiment, um, 
we were we were ex we were analyzing these experiments because of this phenomena called shear jamming, which uh, we will maybe talk about towards the last lecture. The that first system that uh, that we looked at, this one was not rigid in the sense that if I uh, if I um, tried to compress it, uh, it had no shear modulus if I could measure it. If I sheared it in, uh, there's, there was no in linear elastic regime at all. Things would just completely change. But if I looked at the system at the end of this run, where I now had these very strong regions of forces, uh, people call it force chains. I usually, I like calling them force networks because they're not really chains, but there's some intertwined network. This system has shear rigidity or has some linear elastic regime in the following sense that so this, this system was sheared uh, this way, right? So, so, I, it, so I created, uh, even though it, uh, it's not easy to see, that's what they did. So, so I create from a rectangle, I went to some kind of a rhombus. So I have a long diagonal and a short diagonal, and that you can see. So the long diagonal, again, this is um, trying to give you a sense of these systems because they interact only through compressive interactions, right? These are, they don't have any tensile strength at all. They only care if they're pushing against each other, these particles, just like sand grains. So, so this is the dilational direction, and this is the compressive direction. So this is the short diagonal, and this is the long diagonal. So preferentially, you will see chains, right, that are along the compressive direction. So it's sort of the opposite of the, uh, the rectangle picture in real space. The long diagonal is this direction, which doesn't have very many force chains. The short diagonal is where you have lots and lots of force chains because particles got compressed that way. Now with this system, if I reverse shear it, up to some point, which means I am now taking it back to where the diagonals are going to become roughly equal, it actually can sustain that shear. It doesn't fall apart. The network doesn't fall apart. So that kind of where I'm creating a jammed system and jammed in the, to me, a jammed system in, in sort of the broadest sense of the word are solids that are created through external stresses. And this was the original definition of Mike Cates, Jean-Philippe Bouchot, and Pierre Claudin, where they looked at then sort of colloidal systems uh, and granular systems, but athermal, and said, we have this special class of solids where the solids are created by the shear itself. There is no zero stress solid. There is no definition of a solid that exists without the imposed shear. So how do we think about these systems? And so that's, that sort of is, um, will be a theme running through everything that uh, I will talk about in these lectures, that pro either the jammed states themselves or proximity to jamming, things that are very close to getting jammed, what are the kinds of, uh, what kinds of behavior do I see there? Or what kind of statistical mechanics can we construct to understand those? Let me just quickly. Okay, so this is again, uh, these photoelastic experiments. So I'm trying to, um, I should I, let the students take a break, Abhishek, or is it okay? It's an hour. I was thinking I would be uh, done in an hour, but I'm not done. I think it's probably okay to continue. Okay, I, I, uh, okay maybe there's one question in the chat. I mean, I had, I had one quick question, like in the this previous experiment, when you yeah. take back the shear, it comes back to the same network or like? No. Um, Oh, no, yeah. so, it, so so the point is right. That network survives, even so. So this is why strain is not a good variable, right? So this had a large shear strain, 
Yeah. When you started, I had zero share strain. Right. I had one kind, essentially there was no network existing. There was some very weak network. Okay. You strained it up to some share strain and you develop these networks. Right. Now, if you take it back, that network survives. Oh, really? Oh, so you, you get the same kind of strong... Uh, right. And uh, what process. actually sometimes happens is you start building up the network in the other direction too. So it sometimes becomes more robust. But now if I go take it back to that zero strain state, it's nothing like that original state that I started. Okay. Uh, but the, the density is still the same or it's gone down, it increased? Density oh, it's still, still the same. same. Okay. Density, okay, okay. this oh. is sheer. You're not changing volume at all. It's okay. constant volume shear. So this is really what I think is, is to me, uh, the most interesting aspects of these systems is where you're, you're actually being able to change the moduli or actually take something from not being rigid to being rigid through application of stress. Okay. Right, and this you will see is, is a, um, in, in suspensions, this is, this, this, this is a, a, an enormously useful, useful sometimes and, and a problem sometimes in some industries. But yes, so this is purely driven by stress. No density change, no temperature change, right? Like temperature doesn't matter. Uh, I do see there's a chat. I, I had a question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, in, the, in the experiment that you showed previous, uh -huh. in the previous slide, uh, how, how do things change when, uh, when the particles are of identical size? I mean, oh, then they crystallize. Then they crystallize. Um, they will actually form uh, a triangular lattice, a hexagonal packing. Let me see if I can go back. So if these were of the same size, and you all you 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 see a tendency for them to form hexagons, right? They just cannot. Yes. So, so unless you frustrate that, this is 2D. In two dimensions, if you make it monodisperse, you'll get large crystallites. There might be grain boundaries between them, but you'll get large crystallites. And then, you know, then in some ways, and this maybe goes back to the kinds of questions we've been asking more recently, then I, I don't know if the elasticity, so, Adding crystalline order to this, I think uh, is an additional aspect, which has a broken symmetry aspect to it that I don't think we understand completely yet, right? So here I'm saying I am changing rigidity, the response of a system without ever breaking symmetry. I'm not going from a disordered configuration to an ordered configuration. Now, if in addition to that, if the external shearing can actually create some kind of order, break an, a symmetry, then there might be additional features that happen that we have, uh, we've been talking about for the last month or so, but we, I, there's, there's, there's not, you know, it's, I don't understand what that is, what that would do. Uh, just a follow up. Uh, yeah. Like even even in in that case, then if you reverse the stress, the crystalline nature is retained. Or yes, yes, yes. Okay. So okay. so certainly, if you do that, I can tell you that if if this was mono dispersed, the and the shearing created large crystallites. Uh, the grain boundaries might change a little bit when I go back to the original zero strain, but it'll it'll be. Um, so this would be like a sheared hexagonal lattice and that would be an unsheared hexagonal lattice. It will not fall apart. Thank you. Okay, so that was Jitendra, was the, right. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, can we describe the problem in terms of uh, free energy? Well, 
maybe a large deviation function. I don't know what, there's no real free energy here, right? Because there's no temperature. But, you know, can you talk about entropy? Yes, so those are all the, what do we mean by a free energy? Can we write down a partition function? Uh, can we call something a partition function? At least, I think, you know, not I think, you'll see that we, we are able to gen uh, write down generating functions, things that create correlation functions for us. Now I can define a free energy, um, which is negative log of that. Uh, in what sense is it a free energy? What, you know, of course it can generate my correlation functions for me, but you know, what other free energy like attributes does it have? Um, not, not clear, right? We can explore that. Certainly, uh, one of the things you'll see, and this was, uh, goes back to Sridhib's question about the shear moduli, one thing that you, you will see in the last lecture is that uh, the shear moduli that emerge in these systems don't sat have to satisfy the symmetry properties that you get from the existence of a free energy. Because the stress if I have a free energy, then the stress tensor is defined as the derivative of the free energy with respect to strain. And that gives me certain symmetry properties of the elastic moduli tensor. If there is no such relationship, then those symmetry properties are not there. And this has been known in granular systems forever, is that even if you can write it down as an effective elastic media, the elastic moduli don't have the symmetry properties that we are normally assume for crystal for uh, thermal systems or elasticity in general. Okay, I'm going to just show a few more, and then we can go. Um, maybe I'll skip this for now. I'll come back to this. I wanted to show you just some phenomenology in this other system that I've become fascinated by. These are suspensions, right? So people who watch YouTube, this is Ublek, this picture. People can run on Ublek, which is a mixture of cornstarch. So again, go on, if you haven't seen it, go on YouTube and you'll see people running on these vats of cornstarch. And then if they stop running, they sink, right? So what, people have been studying carefully from a physicist's perspective is a similar phenomenon, not quite the same. There are subtle differences, but it's shown here. So what I'm showing you here, this is in a cornstarch suspension, is the shear stress versus the shear rate. So it's a suspension. Uh, you're measuring shear stress versus strain rate. The black, curves here, which are at very low density suspensions, is a straight line, right? And that's what I expect from Newtonian fluids. The viscosity does not depend on my stress or strain rate. So sigma should just go as eta gamma dot. And this eta is then just a material property. <clears throat> but what you see as you keep increasing the packing fraction is at, let's say, this this brown packing fraction, you see it clearly, right? That now essentially you have a vertical jump in your stress, which means your viscosity is, and that's shown in the plot below, and you can go even beyond that. And you start seeing this S-shaped curves, which people like us are normally used to seeing in mean field theories of liquid gas transitions, or Ising models, if I think of sigma as the magnetization and gamma dot as the field or something like that, right? But here you're actually seeing it in these systems. And then if you go to very large packing fractions above sort of the jamming packing fraction, then the system jams, it develops a yield stress, right? So I'm using words which might not be familiar to everyone. So what you see for this gray line here is this system has a stress at zero strain rate. So now this is saying it has become a solid. So now this is a solid, which has some yield stress. And what I mean by that is um, uh, 
here the shear stress now increases as some function of gamma dot, but st starting from a non-zero value, right? So that's, that's a, a signature of a solid. But, so that, that is shear jamming. It actually is very similar to, as we understand now, this photoelastic system of dry grains, the way it shear jammed, um, this in the suspension is a very similar, uh, similar phenomenon. And so this is, these are the viscosities. And again, uh, you see the viscosity goes from being constant to highly non-trivial, right? So I want, I'm gonna show you uh, uh, some pictures of what Wublek actually looks like. But before that, and I will not be able to talk about this at all during the lectures because we are still writing the paper, in cornstarch, in experiments, we can now take all of these viscosity curves and collapse them onto a universal curve. And that universal curve follows a scaling law that, um, that is reminiscent of something that we know in equilibrium statistical mechanics, when we have two different fixed points um, and I have, um, I'm exploring the system as I change, let's say the symmetry of the system, like um, a Heisenberg magnet to an Ising magnet. So I have a Heisenberg fixed point and an Ising fixed point. And now as I change the anisotropy, uh, I should immediately go to the Ising fixed point because I have broken symmetry, but there is a region around the Heisenberg fixed point that persists which is this crossover scaling. So what we find now is just phenomenologically, I can use exactly that same framework to collapse the viscosity here. If I think of the viscosity as the specific heat or the susceptibility and the two, the analogs of the Heisenberg and the Ising fixed points, uh, the Heisenberg fixed point is like frictionless jamming and the Ising fixed point is frictional jamming. So this system transitions between two kinds of fixed points and that's what gives it this behavior. So that, that's all I can say about this, but that was to just sort of tweak your interest. And the reason this happens, right? If you look at cornstarch, this is cornstarch. This is an electron micrograph of cornstarch, right? It's suspended in a fluid. This, this again, uh, disordered shape, et cetera, right? So again, what happens here? The fund of, so really the, the feature that drives this viscosity transition, this abrupt rise in the viscosity is that as you keep shearing the system at larger and larger rates, um, you're bringing, so there is some repulsive interaction between these particles, between cornstarch, because there's electrostatics, let's say. So that keeps them apart. But if you increase the shear stress enough, right, that can overcome that repulsion and actually push the particles on top of each other. So you're transitioning from interactions driven by lubricated contacts to interactions driven by the solid on solid frictional contacts. And that for the last few years has been sort of known to drive this transition. And what we have recently found is that if you just think of frictionless jamming and frictional jamming as sort of two fixed points of some kind of some kind of RG, well, we don't know what that is, it explains this viscosity behavior. So that's pretty remarkable to me. I don't understand it, right? Why it's happening? How do you coarse grain something like this? More surprisingly, and I'll end here and take questions. This is cornstarch. We can do the same data collapse for silica particles, which look like this, right? Much more uniform shaped. So the, the scaling function or the scaling collapse is exactly the same for these two sets of systems. So there is some underlying universality in these systems. What changes of course is, you know, where, like TC, where is this frictional jamming? 
where is this frictionless jamming point? What, what, how, you know, which are non-universal features, but the exponents are the same. The scaling function is the same for both of these systems. So to me, that is a, like, a, you know, uh, it's like a, uh, like someone's telling us there is some underlying universality here that it begs to be discovered. Okay, I'm, I had other things, but I'm gonna stop here and take uh, questions. Yeah, so, that, so I'll begin the next lecture by actually talking about fluctuations and this idea that distributions are reproducible. And that will then lead sort of nicely into what do we mean by a statistical ensemble, et cetera. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Uh, I see one hand up. Devangshu? Uh, yes, uh, good evening, ma'am. Um, Hi. Uh, yeah, so like, uh, since you just now you were talking about constructs, so you said uh, under shear stress, uh, forces uh, are like stronger, is it? Can you hear me? What I'm saying is uh, as you, um, as you strain the system at a higher and higher rate, the stress just definitely goes up, right? Mm -hmm. The shear stress goes up. So that shear stress uh, is, uh, it, again, it's shear. So in the compressive direction, it's going to try to push particles together. Okay. Okay. Now, there is a repulsive interaction between these particles. So uh, as long if the shear stress is uh, not strong enough to overcome that repulsion, that repulsive interaction keeps them apart. Mm -hmm. And people have now played around with all kinds of ways of introducing this repulsion, electrostatic, chemical, et cetera. But if you make the stress high enough, then they will make contact, right? But not all particles will make contact at the same time. It's a disordered system. And mm -hmm. also in the other direction, which is the dilational direction, it, uh, it makes fewer contacts. Okay. Does that? So I'm not yeah. saying, or, uh, I'm, the, the crucial thing is you transition between two kinds of forces between the particles. Forces that are mediated by the liquid in between, which is a fluid mm -hmm. dynamics lubrication force, right? Which has lot, which are, and the lubrication force actually has a singularity as they come together. Um, but the, the, but the surface roughness of these particles sort of cuts off. So it's like, you know, if I push particles together, if they were infinite, in, they, if they were infinitely smooth, then there would be one place where they would make contact and the lubrication force sort of diverges there. But if my surfaces are bumpy, then uh, it'll squeeze out the liquid and make contact at different points. So, so th th these are the rough microscopic pictures of what might be happening, but what is known now um, by analyzing experiments and, and proposing theories is that it's this um, change in the nature of the particle contact from lubricated to solid on solid friction that is necessary to drive this transition. So people have done very careful experiments where they have taken away this repulsive uh, force so that it's always frictional, then it doesn't happen. If you make it such that your particles are infinite, so smooth that actually there's no friction, then it doesn't happen. So you need the fluid stress driving this change to have this phenomenon. So that's, that's. Yeah, and one, uh, one more question, ma'am. Uh, in the uh, beginning of your lecture, you mentioned that uh, these uh, interactions which you consider between these particles are uh, noisy. Uh, but then you also uh, said that uh, we are looking for uh, distribution of these interactions which are reproducible. So uh, when we, uh, in general, when we talk about noise, uh, uh, noise are supposed to be uh, very random. So no. when you say it's reproducible, no, I'm sorry. It's, sorry, uh, let me make me feel. 
let me push back on that, right? So when you say thermal noise, right? I have a very specific form for that. Certainly the, the particle positions are unknown, right? But mm. if you tell me I, I have thermal noise and I have a temperature of T, then I know the probability of finding a state is e to the minus beta e of that state. That's what right. I need. Yes. That's what I need. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I understood that. But like when, I, when you, you mentioned that the interactions are also noisy, is it? So the, the forces are like positions here. The forces are not knowable. Yeah, so they are noisy, but uh, what, what my question is like, how can you reproduce noise uh, when you talk about uh, reproducing the probability distribution so in of the same these interactions? Way, in the same way that if you have thermal, if you have a thermal system, right, then as the system is fluctuating, I explore different states. But if I look at the probability distribution of the energy or the, or, or the, uh, you know, the autocorrelation function or the pair correlation function, at a given temperature, I'll get exactly the same distribution. Okay. Right, so for right. one configuration and the other configuration, so, so the noisy interaction means that I don't, so in a normal system, if you give me the positions and I have a Hamiltonian, the forces are no, not additional degrees of freedom, but here mm -hmm. they are. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, keep asking. Um, Okay, lots of, yeah, okay. Uh, how much does the network configuration depend on the container boundary? It depends on the stresses at the boundary. Yeah, it depends on the boundary, you know, what kind of a boundary it is, uh, all of that. Um, so we will, again, we will look at some idealized systems, but in a completely general situation, no, we are not concentrating in the uh, center away from the boundaries. Um, again, that should become... Uh, okay, D it depends on what question we're asking. So hold on with that question. In the non-shared system, do we still see a network of forces? No, in the particular example I showed you, no. The density was not high enough. I could have started with a system which where their density was high enough and I already had a force network. Sorry, phi is the packing fraction or the density of the system. I should have not used notation before introducing it. What exactly is jamming? We will talk a little bit about it, but as I said, to me, it's, a, it's solidification that occurs out of equilibrium and is driven by external stresses rather than temperature or density. Yeah, we are applying the shear, the experiments are done at a fixed temperature, but again, they, these are actually non-Brownian suspensions. So temperature really doesn't, people have done experiments on Brownian suspensions also, but um, temperature is irrelevant. Okay, surface of each grain is uneven, so solid friction. So some parts, uh, no, so uh, you're asking a very microscopic question. There might be fluids in the, you know, trapped between two grains that have rough surfaces, but that fluid uh, is just trapped between those solid surfaces and it's, and the, the to move the grains, right? to push the grains or to roll them or slide them, I still need to work against the, the roughness of the surface.
when there is uh, the size is microns, then you have Brownian motion. And then we transition into more of a colloidal system. Uh, is the trend so that's a very interesting question. So uh, uh, this this transition uh, the, this this phenomena occurs only at high enough density. But um, what that density is and why that density is there at sort of a critical density is not completely clear. But at very low densities, you will not create this frictional contact. Uh, square shape kind of stacked on top of each other, but this, but this, yeah, sure, I can create one configuration where the stacking is irregular, right? But then if you take this square grains of exactly the same type and you are not creating the stacking by hand, but you have some protocol for creating them, let's say putting them in a box, shaking them and let them fall. Then the question is what, what configurations are more likely or not, right? And this perfect stacking might be one very rare one. So we are not creating these packings by hand. Um, they are emerging from, the, from some external driving, um, but you know, I'm not taking, so the kinds of configuration that you're thinking about, sure, you know, I can get one configuration, which is, but this is not disordered, right? It's, it's, uh, it's still a stacking. So I'm not quite sure I understand. Yeah, I'm not saying that all packings of uh, identical grains will be crystalline, but crystalline is highly likely. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so can you talk, talk more about the scaling? Can you show us the data where you said that there's a collaborative? I cannot, we haven't written the paper yet. I don't, my okay. co-authors are not going to let me show it. Okay. I can show you the, the, not today. I can show you the the scaling the, the the scaling picture. I can discuss the scaling picture as we know it in the equilibrium problem, so that I, you understand what kind of scaling we are talking about. And then I can tell you that that scaling applies here. Uh, but that's about all I can do. So when you say that scaling applies, you mean the same scaling function or the same kind of singularity? No, so the, the same kind of idea of crossover scaling that the Heisen, you know, the idea that the Heisenberg fixed point has one set of exponents and the Ising has a different set of exponents and that there is a crossover region, uh, that idea. But what is was to me completely remarkable is that both silica and cornstarch showed the same scaling function. Okay, yes. That to me was, uh, yeah. But is there a way that you could think of these system in a dynamical fixed points or some? I think so, right? So the question is, um, uh, yeah. So that's the question, right? So what, what, um, so certainly to, to me, it makes sense that, um, that frictionless jamming and frictional jamming are two distinct fixed points. And the reason uh, it, uh, I, that seems natural to me is um, that frictionless systems um, don't even have uh, a, a concept of a torque, right? The forces are always along. So as soon as I introduce torque, to me, it's almost like introducing a different symmetry or something, right? So, so even so, I think torque is a relevant variable. So it'll dri it'll drive it away from that frictionless fixed point. But so far, you know, no one even has a theory of frictionless jamming as a fixed point of some flow. 
So construct, I'm, I'm really excited about the possibility of doing it now that we know it works, right? So we're sort of back you know, in the days of Widom <laughs> and Fisher saying there is scaling. Now, you know, how that happens is, uh, is hopefully you guys will, will, will figure it out. I've also been thinking of microscopic models that might let us do this, like take some, some kind of lattice model, which has both uh, torque and force, and we do some, um, so rigidity percolation, I think, is the basic framework that one would have to rely upon, not percolation, but rigidity percolation. Okay. And then the question of what does rigidity percolation look like when you have no frictional forces and when you have frictional forces and you can have a combination, uh, I think might be a way of exploring this, but so far no one has uh, constructed a lattice model. To me, I think that would be to, you know, to see what might be actually happening. But are there any effective field theory approach to these problems that you will talk? Yeah, so I will talk about the effective field theory for the elasticity, mm -hmm. not for the jamming itself, but for the mechanical properties of the jam state. So that's where we have a field theory. I'll also talk a little bit about a field theory we we did construct for the suspensions, but it really is not very satisfactory to me. Uh, it's there. Um, there is a, um, it's an example of using a kind of an ensemble and a large deviation function, but sort of postulating it based on phenomenology. Uh, and uh, though, yeah. But we do now have a field theory for the mechanical properties, for the elasticity of these systems in the jammed states, uh, but not, not so far in approaching jamming. Okay, thanks. Okay, okay, so I think- uh, Yeah, we are beyond this... time. So yeah, so yeah. I'm, I hope you guys will come up with more questions during your tutorial tomorrow and then uh, we will start from where we left off today. Thank right, you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank actually, you. Yeah, thanks, Bulbul. So, uh, uh, see you all tomorrow. Uh,